All right, welcome back. In case you're just joining us, uh, it's time for us to delve into our conversation. At the beginning of the program, I did say I'll be looking at COVID-19 impacts on jobs. So many jobs have been lost, and some of those jobs have been lost permanently. They were lost because of the pandemic, and I must tell you that some have been lost permanently. My guest is joining me right now, Hilda Krieger. She's the Chief Executive Officer at Jobberman. Hello, Hilda. Hi, Nancy. Hi, how are you? I'm well, how are you doing? We're well too. Hilda, are you in Lagos now? Yes, I am. Okay. I, I live here. <laughs> okay, so how is Lagos? Talk to me about Lagos, because that's a commercial nerve center of the country. That uh, state, city, employs a lot of people, isn't it? Yeah. I would say it, it's true, and I would say it's opened up the past couple of weeks. You know, we moved from no cars on the road to more businesses opening up. Even just, you know, as a, as a business, a jobber man, we saw that our, our, our customers have been more responsive since um, the 4th of May. So I would say there's a spirit that even though there's still lots of fear, and of course people are being conscious about the COVID-19 crisis, there's more, um, we're seeing more brave actions being taken and businesses beginning to open up, which is mm. good news. Which is good news. Now, the International Labour Organization, when I read the report, of course, during this COVID-19, they did say that the sharp decline in working hours uh, globally would lead to about 1.6 billion workers uh, in their formal economy, their jobs being threatened. And I think they went further to say about 190 million people uh, will lose uh, jobs in the world, that's uh, globally. Um, what's your take on COVID-19 impact? on jobs as the chief executive officer of Jobberman, that is one company, you know, that do placements and all of that. What's your own uh, immediate assessment? So I'd say just based on the data we've been seeing, there's a dichotomy happening right now. If you look at the blue collar uh, market where jobs have not been dignified, they're not brought to light and there's no structure around it, there's been a lot of job loss and a lot of it is invisible because nobody's actually tracking um, blue collar workers and how, 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 how their employment is, is evolving, right? And that's, that's, that's truly sad. I think one of the things we need to do better going forward is to dignify blue collar more. Mm. But on the other side, on the white collar side, what we've seen at least on our platform is that even though there's some industries that are being obliterated and jobs are disappearing uh, at scale, things like the automotive industry like oil and gas, we also have a lot of industries that are hiring. Um, on our platform, for example, I think overall in the past two months, we had over 183% increase in job openings. A lot of them in the tech sector, a lot of them in sales and marketing. So a lot of them in fields that would not necessarily be affected by COVID, but rather that where opportunities were created. Mm. So we're seeing a lot of uh, um, openings in the sales and marketing, as well as tech sector. I'll come back to uh, that in a bit. Um, how do you think that businesses, especially I know you, you interface with businesses that hire people, how do you think that businesses or enterprises facing the risk of serious disruptions now, how has it affected jobs? Because a company must be doing well to, to be able to hire. Yeah, that's true. So there's, there's a few things we've noticed. One, for the most, for the most part, um, employers in Nigeria are not yet letting go of at least white collar workers at scale. Typically, we've would have seen we seen an increase in job seekers, but not as large. I think right now people are exploring furloughs and probably salary cuts before that one door shut where you let people go. We've seen that, and, that, and that's, that's, a, that's a good sign. On the other hand, we've also seen that people who had large-scale recruitment projects or programs to run by the end of the year have put them on hold because they don't know there's uncertainty as to whether you know this project is going to go ahead as expected, if our revenues can support the new members of staff. So even situations where candidates had been already provided offer letters, we're seeing employers say, first hold on, we'll let you know when we'd like for you to resume, which of course destabilizes a, a job seeker. You've left your job maybe, or you're excited about finding a new job, and all of a sudden that job's not available to you anymore. So we're seeing that, that level of insecurity. However, for the sectors that actually need um, um, more staff, so as I said, tech sector, I think the medical sector as well, that we're seeing... Um, adoption of technology, so more people who traditionally not have used, let's say, Jobberman to hire, come into our platform because it's an online way to, um, to, 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 to have access to talent. And we're also seeing speed because for them in those industries, COVID has presented such an opportunity that they need to, to ramp up their hiring. Mm. Okay, you said some things which are, are very vital that, especially even the last, your last statement, that they're, they're, are you saying that perhaps there are more job opportunities now than before? Uh 
I no, definitely not. If no. you're to net out the industries that have gained and those that have lost, mm. I'd not say then it's very, very clear who the winners out of this um this mm. this COVID nineteen. And for us as a platform, again, one of the things we did, of course, was to make our listings free because we realized that even for those who might want to hire, say, in essential services or in the medical sector or even tech and logistics, they still they don't have a recruitment budget. When we did that, we actually saw an 183 percent bump in our listings. So we have more jobs on the platform now compared to, let's say, April last year. However, it, this does not account, of course, for the offline sectors, for the blue collar workers. So I'm sure if we're to net it out at that point, of course, the number of job losses is, is greater than the, the, the new jobs coming online right now. Mm. Why do you think that employers in Nigeria are not letting go quickly? I honestly, I think it's a combination of, you know, being optimistic. Nigeria, you know, we're serial optimists here. That's one thing. Second thing is in some sectors, there's actually been regulatory um, like regulatory um, movements to, to, uh, to avoid layoffs. For example, in banking, right. I think they, 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 yeah, there, there was a restriction there. And then also, I think fundamentally, most employers, at least most employers in Nigeria, are honestly trying to do good by their staff. Even places where we've seen um, people laid off, we're seeing that they're keeping the medical cover, they're getting the right amount of, um, of, severage, of severance, um, severance pay. So generally, it's a crisis affecting everybody. And right now, the, the goodwill of employers is, is, is shining through. Mm. So are you saying that that goodwill is so much in Nigeria? Because there are still some people, too, that have lost their jobs. Their employers have told them, just stay away because we're not making money. Some, they did not even notify them. Some, they've actually asked them, just stay away a bit. When the, uh, when the uh, economic environment improves, we'll hire you again. Yeah. I would say, of course, the intentions may be good for the most part. I choose to believe that for the most part, intentions are good. But at, at the end of the day, a business has to do what they need to do in order to survive, right? If I keep you on for two or three or four extra months, but it depletes our cash flow to a point where we can't even operate after COVID, that beats the whole point. So you have to understand that if you might be the best employee, but given your company situation right now, you still are not able to keep your job simply because it's survival. Everybody right now is trying to survive. Most businesses are trying to survive. We're not getting supplementary, you know, um, aid or cash cash injections from the government like in different countries. So right now, every country is trying to make sure that after this pandemic, they're still able to be competitive in the business. And that might include letting people go. Now, the, from your last point, uh, we know what is happening globally. Governments are also supporting businesses. Here in Nigeria, is also the same uh, because the central bank, for example, through the NISL Microfinance Bank, has the 50 billion naira uh, to support MSMEs. And you will agree with me that we have a lot of MSMEs in Nigeria. Micro enterprises are that that provide about 84% of jobs and 96% employment. 41.5 .5 million micro enterprises out of the 41.6 million businesses we have. So uh, I guess that Jobberman is dealing with perhaps 100,000 left of the medium and the big businesses. <laughs> no. <laughs> Deal with everybody from businesses with five people to 10 people. Oh, to really? So, so if I want to hire someone now, I, you, you, you can get me a platform to hire someone. You, exactly. And by the way, it would be completely free. Okay. Be, so especially for a small business, like Jovan has, has we've, we've spent a lot of time innovating for products that, that are not, that are affordable enough for small businesses. So everybody can recruit on Jovan right now. Okay. Okay. So where I was going to actually is the assistance for businesses, like we've seen in other countries. There's a 50 billion naira targeted credit facility for households and small businesses. Small businesses, I think, can assess up to 5 million. There, is also, there are also other intervention programs across the medical, pharmaceuticals, hospitals, and all of that. There's a 100 billion uh, naira facility for that. How do you think that all this can really impact the job market? Perhaps those businesses that have laid off workers can rehire them again or ask them to come back or hire new staff? Yeah. I think a number of ways. Of, of course, definitely, you, if you don't have to, to do layoffs, you won't do layoffs. If you can even hire more, it, well and good, so your projects can go on and you know economic activity is stimulated that way. But even more importantly, for some businesses, it could be the kind of um, stimulus that helps you support remote work, right? It's going to be a while before we can move freely, before we can all be in the office freely. And in the meantime, small businesses need help um, to, to navigate <coughs> this remote situation. If we think about, for example, um, our infrastructure, power is, 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 is not the best here. Data is expensive. If you want your staff to work safely in a remote environment, you kind of have to facilitate these, these aspects of it. And such interventions for government would help small businesses, give them the, the capital or at least um, the means to do this and support their staff.
Hilda, still talking about governments and what government can do. What do you think can be the urgent uh, policy responses, apart from what I've talked about, that government can do to help businesses? Because if they help businesses, definitely the labor market will be assisted. Yeah. I think a, a few things you can do. First of all, just in terms of labor market, one of the things we can do, and which is what we're fighting for, is more transparency in the job space. Right now, there are lots of, of open jobs, but then clearly, because we, we don't have a history of, of hiring transparently, it means that some opportunities are sitting um, uncaptured by young people, even by just job seekers. So they need to do a lot more around saying, okay, fine, we know right now there is a labor crunch, but here are all the jobs available. A, a, a single source of truth where anybody who's looking for a job um, can, can access that. And at the same time, employers can actually reach out to talent um, in a technology-driven technology -driven way. That's the one thing. The second thing is, I think, especially for small businesses, there has to be a conversation around um, tax relief, or around like relief from levies. Right now, not, not much is coming in. And yet there's still some core expenditure for a large company, for a multinational, this is something they can, you know, they've, they've accounted for. But for very many small businesses who work on, I think, on average, some research has been done that small business in Nigeria, the micro business is talking about. On average, they are keeping around 21 days of cash. For uh, for businesses that survive, we need to go beyond just, you know, a credit facility etc. We need to also reduce the obligation on them um, to, to pay out money to the government or to state governments in forms of taxes. Maybe I know they already delayed like tax returns. I think in Lagos State for a couple of months. But even just the percentage they're paying could be helpful. Because if you're going to wipe out um, a small business's entire reserves because of taxes, and again, that also beats the point. Hilda, are you noticing that perhaps the stay-at-home and work economy has also increased? Uh, you, you understand? I don't know if you have such, uh, yes, in your, in your, on your platform, whereby stay-at-home and work economy has also increased. Are they also hiring people that will work remotely? You understand what I yeah. mean in terms of virtual spaces now i don't even need to have an office you know yeah. but i'm a company but i'm stay yeah. at home and work company and i'm hiring yeah. people that are working yeah. remotely so we've seen an increase in remote work definitely so some of them is co a contractor some of them are permanent staff and the thing is for the most part it could be new new businesses altogether but also it's businesses who because of certain circumstances, have no choice but to onboard people remotely. I mean, I'd love for you to be in the office with me, but then we need to get this started, and you have to join um, today, not tomorrow. And so the result of that is you onboard staff remotely. This has implications for performance management. It has implications for staff morale, but we're seeing a rise in it. Of course, if you're looking for a graphic designer right now, there's no need for them to come to your physical premises. So remote, remote work is, is on the increase. And also, we're seeing more field work. So field agents, a salesperson doesn't have to go to the, the company all the time, a marketing person who spends time mostly in the field because this is independent work as well and doesn't necessarily require um, a physical space where people meet every day. How do you think that this, uh, the COVID-19, is it really a catalyst for the reinvention of work in Nigeria or even globally? Or, and if it's a reinvention, is it temporal? You know, or yeah. is it just going to be permanent? So I've asked you three questions now. <laughs> God help you. <laughs> it's right. I'd say globally, yes, but it's going to take a while before the trend actually filters down to Nigeria, and I'll tell you why. Our infrastructure is not, not built up to enable remote working at scale. For the average person, the average person in Nigeria does not switch on a generator when electricity goes, which means that for a huge part of their day, they would end up being unproductive. The average person does not buy more than one GB of data a month, if at all, which means if they have to be, you know, on Slack and on Zoom all day, they'll be unproductive. So what's going to happen is that for most small businesses, the easiest way, the, the, the most cost efficient way for them to operate is actually in a physical space. I believe that most of our businesses are going to revert to that. There will be a sec subsection, though, where maybe, especially in the larger businesses, where um, conversations have been happening around, let's say, flexi hours, but the company wasn't sure. Now this um, COVID-19 lockdown has forced them to experiment with flexi hours, and guess what? Nothing broke down. So they'll be able to embrace that um, uh, uh, more. You'll find, as opposed to, let's say, one day a week, one day a month remote, people are doing one day a week, two days a week. I think we're going to see a lot more of that, but that's in more structured businesses and not in the small companies. How do you think that um, employers, what are employers thinking about remote work now? Is this something they want to continue? Just dovetailing um, from what you've said, perhaps two days remote work, two days in the office or thereabouts. How are employers taking that? Uh, they've so not been able to adapt or it's because of coronavirus pandemic, we just have to adapt by force. 
you know yeah. so how are they taking it a lot of people it's actually adop adopting by force um even now because going back to work you have to do it in shifts so you're having you know batch a batch b batch c in the office um and that's not something employers necessarily want but then because of the situation you have to adapt to it because of that we're seeing um dif uh, different ideas come out on for example how do you maintain staff morale right mm -hmm. because if you don't have your people in a physical space they could just drift um how do you do performance management how do you how do you how do you measure output how do you measure productivity these are big questions that depending on the size of your company your company culture your business are going to take a while to answer so while we figure it out i think for most businesses actually it's just literally waking up every day and trying to to, to, to hold your company together, make sure people are doing the work they're supposed to do, making sure they're productive in the best way possible and facilitating that. Mm. So it means companies are taking it one day at a time because we've not really seen this, this pandemic before. That's like in modern day history. All of us are getting used to it. So perhaps companies are just taking it one day at a time, re-innovating, re imagining their businesses as they go on. The next question for you is that what changes? Okay, you want to say something? I think stuff like for tech businesses, for example, who are, who are used to this, you know, working remote, working seamlessly, software developers, people who have been at home this whole time. So for them, it's business as usual. Oh, it's business as usual. What changes are on the job and workspace right now in terms of perhaps employees? What kind of skills should employees begin to have due to the new normal? that COVID-19 okay. has forced on us? For the, I'll, just, I'll put it in, in, in categories, right? So for the young people, I would say invest in a hard skill that you can layer with digital and soft skills that can link you to a market. You know, right now, it's easier to actually just study to be a tailor, start your fashion business, go on Instagram and begin to sell that it might be for you to get a, a nine to five job if, you, if you've just left university. That's the truth. Because unemployment is at 23.1%, which means the opportunities are not, in white collar work especially are not that common. So I'd say that that's the advice for a, 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 a fresh graduate. For people who have been in the workplace already, I'd say two things. One, you need to be adaptable. Right now, your job description from last year might no longer be relevant. The focus of your company and the unique situation will call for you to do either more than what you previously were doing or even something different, different, different altogether. And if you want to be to survive in your environment, you need to be able to adapt. The third thing is soft skills. I think for us, one of the, th one of the some of the research we've done at Jobberman, we discovered that soft skills are a little gap that most employers have. Um, some of have, have a first class degree, but actually can't express themselves. They can't create a great presentation. They don't have workplace etiquette. And if you want to be successful in the workplace, this is increasingly important. OK, um, we will take a break shortly. And when we come back, we'll continue the discussion. But just before we take a break, l let me ask you this question, um, Hilda. Hilda, are you still there? OK, we've talked about perhaps skills that employees need to have. Are there things that you're also seeing from management and leadership that is changing due to COVID-19 pandemic, you know? Uh, things or, you know, strategies that are changing, uh, management strategies changing that will definitely impact hiring of employees? Oh, definitely. Should I answer that now? After the yes, pandemic? yes. Answer right now. Okay, so I would say, of course, we're seeing change patterns. One, there's a lot more empathy because not everybody's situation is the same. You know, your staff are working at home with their children, with their parents. You have to actually empathize the situation. Um, this means the way you manage them is going to be different. We're seeing a move away from the micromanagement style where you want to know what everybody's doing every given minute to a more output-driven style where you say, if we agree that you're going to uh, submit this deliverable by 4 p.m. today, I want to continue to do it. Um, this means that as managers hire, increasingly they are going to look for people who are self-starters, who can self-supervise and self-manage, and who are reliable. Because if, you, if, I, if I can't see you, if I'm not there to ensure you're going to do what you have to do, I need to trust that you're going to do it to a certain um, ability. Mm. Okay. Hilda, let's quickly take a break. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation on COVID-19 and jobs. Uh, if you have your questions, please do send them now. Buzz me right now on Twitter at Nancy. Ilo. You can also send us a message or your question at uh, Moneyline TV on Twitter. You can go to Facebook Moneyline TV. You can find us on all our social media platforms. Send us your questions and your comments right now so that Hilda can, can answer. Let's quickly take this break. We'll be right back. The latest GDP report, um, the service growth, um, the growth of the um, information and telecom sector 
um, went down from 10% last quarter to 9% growth rate last quarter. And that's one of our biggest growth drivers um, in our economy. So supporting those sectors and making sure that as soon as, you know, um, the world opens up again after the pandemic, we are able to react quickly and um, basically capitalize on some opportunities that are available, uh, that will be available after the pandemic. Uh, so I don't think it's the time to slash budgets. And I do think it's time to borrow, but I think, first of all, we should be borrowing wisely and trying to get the best interest rates we can. And second of all, we should be deploying those funds wisely, not using them to like defend defend the Naira from devaluation, not using them to um, support fuel subsidies, but actually using them in ways that will actually grow the economy uh, or prevent important, crucial, critical sectors from collapsing. All right, welcome back to the program. Hilda Krieger is still with me. She's the chief executive officer at Jobberman. Uh, when I was taking a look at what, uh, what I call it, the report now, you know, I saw what you guys put out, uh, that Jobberman saw 70% decrease in job listings because of the economic lockdowns. What's the situation right now? So initially, we saw a 70% decrease, I think, the first week of lockdown. We, we, we literally everything just plummeted. And I think that's because there was that shock, you know, business literally ground to a halt. But then we did two things. So one, we decided to remove the barrier of cost to the platform to say, okay, fine, if everybody's now um, rationing their budget and then have recruitment spend necessarily, let's make um, our offering at least a listing free. You know, because for us, the most important thing was how can we support our clients right now? This seemed to be the best way. So we'd, uh, after doing that, we actually realized over the next couple of weeks or so that um, the listings began to rise again. And right now, we're going to a place where, as I said, mentioned earlier, we're almost at 183% higher than, than what we were before. But it was that initial shock that, that um, froze recruitment completely. Mm. So you, you talked about earlier some specific roles that we're seeing right now. I want us to break it down. You did also mention, I'll come to the blue collar economy uh, in a bit and why we're seeing what we're seeing right there uh, compared to the white collar economy. But just take me through some of the specific roles uh, that we're seeing and increasing right now. I know you mentioned sales and marketing earlier uh, and, and jobs around technology, expansion on that. Yeah. So we've had lots of um, software development jobs, for example, um, IT support roles, all these um, jobs that would, of course, naturally, there'll be a boost if more people are using online tools. Um, that's been, that's, that's been, that was uh, almost 18% growth. We also had a huge growth in business development and sales. I think that 62% of our roles were coming from those sectors. And that's also natural. In a situation where um, revenue is getting harder to bring in, of course, you're going to boost your sales team um, in a way because sales, sales teams typically earn a lower salary and work off commissions. So it's a win-win um, for, for the company as well. So we've seen that grow a lot. We've also seen, um, so if you just break down the tech some more, um, graphic design, digital marketing, data analytics, all that is on the increase as well um, and, and has grown over the past few months. Does that mean that um, these sectors which you've mentioned now, are they where job opportunities are right now in this new normal? So for someone watching us right now, should they go acquire skills in that area? Because that's what the new normal is forcing on the economy right now. Or should they just wait, wait on this pandemic that it will go in the next like one, two, three years and we're back again to normal? But how would the person even survive though? <laughs> So the thing is, I don't think that this is necessarily the jobs the new normal because th this is still almost crisis mode, right? We can't say we are post-COVID pandemic mm. yet. These are jobs that are right now in a time of crisis where not many people are spending money or, or not many people are recruiting. These are roles people want. However, I think about the new normal just going to be life post the lockdown. I think a lot of opportunity lies in technology. A lot of opportunity lies in the ability to connect offline hard skills to online marketplaces, um, hence my my my, my um, example earlier about people in the creative sector. You know, um, that's where opportunity lies. If unless you're really passionate about these areas, don't go changing your life plans and investing a lot in them because this these are crisis jobs. 
these are crisis jobs. Even if we're to look, you know, in August this year, I can almost guarantee that this profile will have changed. Even without COVID-19, typically in Nigeria, we find that different jobs are booming at different times. The recruitment cycle for almost every single industry. So it, it's not the best um, way to judge it, to judge these jobs, crisis jobs, if I can call them that, as um, what's going to be happening a year, two years or three years from now. Mm. Do you think that as a country we've been able to um, decipher the scope of this pandemic? Because as a country we're struggling with 23.1% unemployment rate, a 40% or 40.1% poverty rate with about 82.9 million poor people, according to the NBS, excluding Borono State. I always like saying that because Borono is not part of that survey. So do you think that we've been able to understand the scope of this pandemic and what the impact will be on the employment, unemployment rate, which is at 23.1% for, for young people now. So will it impact this more uh, short to medium so I, term? I don't think we've even gotten to you know, half, the half of it. And I don't think any country in the world has, right? So it, everybody's trying to figure this out at the same time. If you think about it this way, we are, um, the summer, summer is almost here, so the end of the school year, we're receiving another wave of thousands and thousands mm. of people. They're graduating to a market with no jobs with barely any jobs. So on top of the, the job losses that happen in the experienced market, um, in, in the experienced employed labor market, there's fresh graduates coming in. And there's fresh graduates who, you know, had, still hadn't gotten jobs. We find that on average, you know, it, some people, it takes them almost a year, sometimes two years to find a job post-graduation. So we already have a backlog when it comes to job creation in the country. This COVID-19 crisis is only going to make that worse. Mm. I don't think we've seen half of it yet. Now, the, the, the question also, what, do you think that sufficiency of competence is also um, an inhibition because a lot of people also say you are, you are the chief executive officer of a job listing company, job of mine for crying out loud. So you should be able to tell me this. What problem do we have? Do we have many jobs, but fewer people? Yeah, you know where I'm going, but fewer people to fill that space because they do not have those competences. So tell me now, let me hear it here, because I always hear it all the time that, oh, there are many jobs, but our Nigerian graduates are unemployable. Or, uh, you know, we have literates. We have so many people that have the skills, but no jobs. So which one is it? So I'd say I, I, I get this question a lot and I really don't like it, but I have a, I have a, I have a standard answer for it. Here's the thing. For people, especially young people, to have access to dignified livelihoods or work, three things have to happen it, together. One, we need to have strong and relevant education and training systems that can get people ready for work. Two, we need to have democratic access to jobs so that everybody can see what opportunities are out there and you know the best person can get the best role, can get the right role. Three, we need strong private and public sector markets that are actually creating opportunities for these people and creating the jobs or going to even inter facilitating entrepreneurship opportunities. In Nigeria today, there's, there's leakage, it's broken. All those three, there's something broken along all those three aspects. Our education system is not, you know, top best in the world necessarily. We see lots of graduates that graduate, you're a first class degree holder, you can't even write a CV. That's, the, that's just a fact. Two, we don't have democratic access. Less than 30% of jobs in Nigeria today are filled transparently. Mostly, it, there's lots of nepotism happening. There's lots of, you know, um, hiring my friend's son because at least I know I know he needs a job and things like that. So the best person doesn't get the best job, which means you could be smart, but if you're not doing the right job, you won't be as productive in the workplace and people might call you unemployable. Then third, of course, is a strong public and private sector markets. And given that, you know, um, our, our rate of, of our population growth rate has been growing higher than the um, than GDP growth rate, of course, there's going to be an issue on the job creation side. So it's not fair to, to address Nigerians as unemployable when there are challenges across all these things. What we need to do is to come together and say, OK, how do we fix each of these three elements? Um, and I'll give an example. For example, with Jobberman, on the training, we've decided that we're going to invest in soft skills. We have a soft skills curriculum that's free for everybody to take up because, you know, it's a huge gap. We can't do all the technical training and we can't change curriculums but that's something we can do. On democratic access, that's literally how our platform is built. We are a marketplace that links the best talent to the best employers. And we try to make sure our jobs, we've got a database of 2.5 million job seekers and 60,000 employers. We try to make sure jobs go out as far and as wide as possible. And then of course, on the employer side, on the, on the public and private sector market side, we're constantly engaging with employers, creating innovative products for them and saying, guys, 
recruiting transparently is the, is the way to go. And wherever there are jobs, we need to make sure that as many people have access to them as possible. But again, until those three aspects are completely fixed, we really shouldn't be calling people unemployable. Mm. I, think, I think you just recently put that because the processes are already broken. What, what, what challenges do employers tell you they face, especially from those they hire from you? Over time, what? I think the, the most common one we saw again it was this around soft skills was a big one. The second thing was something around just workplace readiness. So you know, the, if and, and I won't blame them. If I think about it, there are very few universities in Nigeria that have career services, which means people are going to university, are going to higher education institutions, but not getting the career guidance it takes to help you transition from school life or from educational system to the workplace system. And we get that feedback a lot, that these young graduates, they're not ready for work. Either they, it could be dress code, it could be attitude, it could be so many other soft things that because there's, there's a gap when it comes to career guidance as you come up through the system, you go to the workplace and you're shocked, your employer is also shocked. Mm. You just made a very salient point, which I don't think we're taking seriously, the career guidance system, isn't it? Are there other clients where this is also practiced? Because just like you said, a lot of graduates or people that are unemployed now will want to get the next job. But are they ready to be able to integrate into that job? You know, just as one can even say as simple as a dress code or as simple as an at attitude, you know. Yeah. But those are soft skills that you, that you need. So how essential is that career guidance system? And where should it come from? You know, is it, is it, you understand what I mean? Yeah, it's absolutely essential. And if you think about it, like private universities in Nigeria actually have a place like Covenant University. You know, you have a dress code to go to, to the classroom, you have put on your shirt, you have to dress like you're going to work. They do have those services. But most public universities d don't necessarily have that. So the difference in access already. If you go to a private school, you're better off than if you go to, to um, a government school. I believe that ideally it should sit somewhere within the university system, but that's not possible. One of the things that we've done, again, on top of a soft skills curriculum, I think pre-COVID, we're also holding career fairs, like having these employability trainings with um, young people. You know, how do you dress up to go to work? How do you do a business presentation? Of course, now we've scaled it up. We've already trained 15,000 people. But it has to, if it cannot be, if it cannot be housed in the education system right now, it could be housed through partnerships. So working with a particular university to provide these services to their final year students, for example. Um, a lot of NGOs right now and multilateral organizations are investing in this work um, school to work transition space and this is one of the things that um, can be of, of an area of focus mm. you also said something that perhaps you see a first class graduate not able to write a cv i've seen that yeah. couple of times and you know when i see it i'm like what why why is it like that but you've actually did mention the challenges across those three areas uh, talking about education uh, the democratic access to jobs and the role of the private and, and, and public uh, system. Now, the, the other question which I'll go back to is the blue collar economy. We've seen which jobs do we even have more in Nigeria, the blue or the white? Of course, blue. <laughs> blue. In most economies, it's blue, pretty much in all, every economy. So, so why are we seeing that deficiency here in Nigeria around that blue collar economy? You know, because just so like... I think from, I okay, go ahead of it is the fact that in Nigeria and in most African countries, blue collar work has not been dignified. Mm -hmm. Everybody who wants their child to be a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, nobody wants them to be an AC technician or a cleaner or a nanny. And here's the thing, if you go to countries where blue collar work has been structured and dignified, it's actually very expensive. If you want to get a plumber in London, they're going to charge you by the hour. And by the time your job is done, you'll have paid them almost half your salary because that's that that's how structured the blue collar industry has 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 has, has become in in, su in such areas, right? In our case, because of this mindset, everybody underlooks blue collar work, and yet they're completely essential. They're completely essential, and they're a way to earn a good living. If you speak to somebody who has a good career as an AC technician, they could be making more money than an entry level, um, you know, HR associate in, in some cases. There's a lot of potential when you think about the carpentry industry, you think about um, the clothing industry, the food and agriculture industry, um, and a lot of all these other blue collar roles as well, right? There's a lot of potential there, but we need to work on the mindsets first, the fact that not everybody in Nigeria is going to be a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, an accountant. You might end up being a plumber, and that's okay. This is how you can define your career path. This is how you move from an entry-level plumber or to, from an apprentice to having a team that works with you to building a business out of it. We need to be able to meet um, 
uh, uh, blue collar workers at that point of need and help them structure that out as well. If we've got those, that structure and those protections in place, then one, it's easier to command a higher value for their work. And two, in situations like this where there's a crisis, it's actually much, much easier to track how, just the number of job losses and what we can do to also intervene in the blue collar market. Mm. Who should bring that change? Because I like what you said in terms of we should also dignify blue collar job. Uh, you go abroad, you see those in blue collar, they, they end and it doesn't matter. They would start from uh, their young age and they'll go on like that. They train their children, they are riding nice cars and all of that. But here in Nigeria, uh, we look at them as menial jobs. So whose responsibility is that uh, to change that mindset, to change the system, to give it a kind of structure for the blue economy to uh, transition from what we're seeing it right now to say, it's okay if you are a plumber, it's okay for you to be a carpenter and you shouldn't be looked down on for that if you're a carpenter or even if you're a cleaner, you're a roadside sweeper, you can still train yeah. your children, you ride the best of cars. So how do we get to that level? Whose responsibility is that? So I think there's a policy responsibility which would come like from, um, from government, of course, right? Um, there's something around like maybe this is for NGOs which is around mindsets, educating parents especially, because sometimes you might want to be a tailor and your mom says, no, I want a doctor. So there's that, there's that uh, mindset, mindset, mindset um, shifting which has to happen both for the parents and the children. Um, and then finally, of course, there is something around, which is a partnership between people like Jobman, for example, and the government, which would verify these um, workers. One of the biggest risks around blue collar is the fact that people say, I don't know who's coming to my house, you know? So if we had a system that could actually verify and say, this, is, this person is who they are, they were trained in this, let's say, technical institution, and you kind of have like a bio about them and it creates comfort or like a sense of trust, that would be a, a first step. So there's still roles for every person to play. The government, the private sector, us who would use those blue collar workers as well, you know, individuals, um, and then platforms that could still increase access to jobs and disseminate blue collar jobs to the workers as well. You can imagine. Course, okay, yeah. go ahead. It would require different thinking. If you want to do blue collar, for example, which is something we've been thinking about, it's not going to be online. Most likely it's going to be USSD. Best case scenario, it's WhatsApp, because lots of blue collar work workers won't be as sophisticated or have sophisticated tools to let them um, access heavy websites all the time. So it's, it requires difference in thinking as well. Mm. You can imagine if you, if you tell your mom or your dad, Dad, I, I want to be a sophisticated carpenter. Oh, I would be like, what? You say what? Go to school <laughs> first or something. <laughs> you know, I want to be a tailor. Just go to school first. When you finish, you can come back. Because we've seen a lot of children or a lot of people, uh, you know, they finish studying law, they are singing. You know, yeah. they finish doing this, they are doing that. You know, so, <laughs> so it's... It, it, no, I was going to say a good real life example of what's of dignifying um, blue collar, not blue collar work, but you know, um, that's happening right now is I think a partnership between the Lagos State Employment Trust Fund and the Nani Academy. You probably haven't heard of them. The Nani Academy actually takes ladies and trains them in housekeeping and child rearing, you know, how to handle medicines, how to do a balanced diet, everything. And because of that, these nannies are able to attract a lot, um, a premium salary on the market, right? So you find somebody actually making a decision to be a career nanny because of, they've gotten the right training, they've gotten the right role, they've got career progression, and they're actually earning more money in the wood in an office. That's like a small pilot, but imagine if you could scale that across different industries, across different job roles, and just bring that same level of credibility. What would you tell people that have lost their jobs right now because of uh, coronavirus pandemic or are unemployed? What, yeah. what would I you think tell them? I'd say don't take it too personally. It's possible you did your best at your job and you, you still lost it, not because of what you did, but because of the situation the employer is in. What you need to do now is, first of all, invest in yourself. So if you've been thinking about learning a particular new skill, if you want to do something in your area, learn it now, now that you've got the time, and then activate your network. Be clear about what you want to do and then reach out to the kind of people that could help you. It's, it might be a long ride because there's not, you know, this is not like the most um, job, not, not the most conducive market for a job seeker. But if every single day you do once, one, we take one small step towards your dream job, you'll get there. Reach out to a contact, send your CV in, sign up to Jobberman. There's lots of jobs on the platform. Um, take a soft skills training. You know, ours right now is running and it's free, but then you can do another training. LinkedIn has lots of learning courses as well. The most important thing, one of the biggest things about job loss is the depression it brings. Mm. You're coming from a situation yeah. where you've been earning and you're self-sustaining and that's been stolen away from you. Things like investing in yourself um, academically or learning actually help to st um, stimulate that, that depression away. But if you sit down and feel sorry for yourself, it's, it, won't be, it, it will make matters worse for you. Mm. What, are, what are recruitment, uh, recruitment 
did I say that word? Recruitment, okay. <laughs> Recruitment agencies such as you or, um, um, you know, companies. What are the top three skills they're looking for? Recruit when they the tell agency? you, yes, w w or companies, of like, these are the top three things we're looking for. That is, I'm talking about a survey. What are the top three things they're looking for? Is it in terms of educational skills, in terms of perhaps some soft or hard skills? You know, what are, what are they looking for? So I'd say hard skills, I'd say definitely digital skills. You know, everybody needs somebody who can run, who can use a computer, have introductory knowledge of Excel, PowerPoint, the tools. You need to be able to do that. Um, that's the first thing. Soft skills are a big one. Um, you can't navigate the workplace successfully without soft skills. That's a fact. The third one, which I hate to say, but it's the truth, is experience. A lot of employers just want some experience. Training budgets for most companies are not that large. So even when they're asking for entry-level jobs, they're still asking for two years of experience because everybody's looking for something that's slightly pre-baked. Somebody who knows what to do as opposed to a fresh graduate. Of course, the larger companies keep hiring fresh graduates, but smaller, com smaller businesses expect that even somebody who's just coming in fresh should have an idea what they want to do. So unfortunately, experience is something they're looking for. And if what that means for you as a young job seeker, as a fresh graduate, is find ways to um, boost your CV. You can do, if you can afford it, do an unpaid internship, do an apprenticeship, look for, you know, work projects you can do, um, and just try and get, fill out your CV with, with at least bits of work that you've, 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 you've worked on. I was coming to that uh, for perhaps young graduates or people that are freshly, uh, or people that have not, do not have experience. There are ways by which they can gather experience, just like you said, internship. You know, they can also do volunteer services and all of that and add it to their CV. They can also look for mentors, isn't it, to mentor them? Are and even just the way you think about work, right? You find lots of people who say, I don't have work experience. But guess what? Your mom has a shop. You've been keeping her books. You've been doing inventory. You've been actually taking care of the shop, you know? That is work experience. And we have to let young people know that every single piece of work you've done counts. You've done, if, if you it, because the skills you've learned if you've been taking care of your parents shop for example you, you you know bookkeeping that's a solid skill you know customer management um you know inventory taking those are solid skills but we tend to overlook them because they happen in informal settings all these are actually apprenticeships and you think about it that way a lot of young people have opportunity for apprenticeships people work with their uncle with a garage um over the holidays people might do um agricultural deliveries or something like that so many so many pieces of exposure to work that we ignore because it's not in a big company or because we didn't get a salary. And we need to be able to structure that and also present it as, as, as work we've done in our careers. Yes, you should also be able to be knowledgeable to present that as, as a work experience in your CV, isn't it? Um, let's take a look at this as we uh, finalize uh, the uh, program. As employers are, are going to be coming back to work uh, and their employees coming back to work, the question is, how do you handle COVID-19? Should employers yeah. test their employees? Have, have those kind of questions, <laughs> uh, you know, started yeah. around reopening of the economy or reopening of jobs? Should they test their employees? And even if you test, if it's positive or negative, it doesn't guarantee that the person cannot contract it again tomorrow. Yes. Yeah. So some, some people are considering testing, but I've not seen that a lot. And there's some companies actually offering tests. I think there's one, Moby Health, which is a telehealth company, offering um, testing for all employees. Um, but then more important, I think what's more important is to have like one clear communication on what going back to work means. How are you going to be transported to work? Are you giving your staff masks? What's the rule for wearing masks? Where does everybody sit? What percentage of your workforce comes on a given day? What we're doing at Jobberman is that we've got three batches. So we've got batch A batch B and batch C. Batch A and batch B will alternate in two week periods. So two weeks on, two weeks off. That way, in case you're sick, you've got enough of a quarantine period for, for us to find out, right? And then batch C consists of either parents of young children or school going age who can't leave yet. People who live very, very far away and have to take a lot of public transportation in order to get to work. Or people who for some reason just feel like right now they'd rather be working from home. And those people will stay remote um, for the foreseeable future if, if, if that's their preference. So if, if you're an employer thinking about it, think, think along those areas. How do you protect your people? Have the sanitizers in place, have temperature checks, avoid food caterers, let everybody bring their food, you know, and wipe down the microwave after you use it. You have to think about that entire spectrum of possibilities and then communicate, over-communicate to your staff about it so that everybody knows what the plan is. Thank you very much, Hilda. I think we've had an extensive discussion. Yes, Tell yeah. me, Thank you. isn't it extensive across board? So I hope that our viewers have been able to take one, two, three things 
out of this interview. Thank you very much, Hilda. I'll speak with you again sometime. I'm just a phone call away. <laughs> All right, that's the much we can take. I've been speaking with Hilda Krieger, who is the Chief Executive Officer at Jobberman. We've been looking at perhaps job opportunities, and I hope you took some things away. It's not only the pandemic or the negative side we'll be looking at.